Welcome to part two of this guide to combat in the Battalion Combat series of games. In part one, we had a look on a kind of more theoretical level, the many, many options, the many different ways of thinking about it, the many choices, interesting, fascinating gaming choices that you have. In this part two, we're going to go through a worked example. It's not a perfect example, but I hope it will illustrate how you can apply some of the many, many choices that we have in this great game. So I've given you the 4th Cavalry Brigade from Panzer's Last Stand here. Pretty, pretty hefty unit. It contains an HQ with two artillery. It's got four cavalry battalions, each of which is assault capable. It's got a Tiger II tank, which is a breakthrough red hard AV, very meaty. It's got some half tracks which are equipped with uh, large caliber guns and infantry in its reconnaissance unit, making it a very, very flexible unit. A bit light in the AV department, but still very flexible. You've got a Stug 3 assault gun battalion, which can either be set to support where it provides red support, or it can be as a unit on the map where it's then a limited AV. To see the differences, you can go back to these charts which talk about limited AV and attack capable units with red support. And finally, you've got a flak battalion, a Luftwaffe flak battalion attached to. So this well beefed up cavalry brigade gives you the maximum capability of these following things. You can't do all of these following things together, but you could do a maximum of eight fire events from these four units, four shock attacks, or up to eight engagements, or up to eight attacks by fire, or two reconnaissances. Obviously that totals, what, eight, 16, 22. So you can do eight out of 22 different things, potentially. Likewise, you could have a maximum of five regular attacks with three assists, or you could do four regular attacks each with an assist. It just depends if you want to use the recon unit for a regular attack, or you want to use it as an assist for one of the cavalry battalions. You've got two barrages that are attached with the HQ. You could assign further barrages at the beginning of the turn in the assignment phase. You could assign some air units, if you have any, to beef up some of these attacks, but that's outside the scope of this cavalry brigade as it's at the moment. And you also have a couple of big engagement zones up to three hexes wide, from the Tiger II and from the 88. I'll be covering engagement zones in the video about command and control. So a lot of different choices. Typically, you might do three assisted uh, and supported regular attacks, two of which would have a suppression barrage, maybe all three if you could chuck in an air unit. You might do a reconnaissance activity followed by an attack by fire, but if the reconnaissance activity, that's placing an objective further along, didn't work, you might have to do it twice. And then finish off with your tiger doing an engagement, perhaps, and followed up by shock attack with the 88 and the Stug both in support, the 88 providing defensive support and a big engagement zone, and the Stug providing red attack support. That, that would be a more typical thing from all of those options that you have. Let's have a look at what that might actually look like. Here we have your Stug in support providing red attack support, and here you have your 88 providing standoff uh, defensive support with a range of three. We could mount two regular attacks each assisted by another battalion and each supported by barrage. This will give you some good strong mods, one for the assist, one for the red support, and two for the suppression barrage. That will give you a plus four. That will give you a nice breakthrough attack. You might then follow that up pushing through the hole, your reconnaissance, they might place an objective further beyond, and you may attack by fire against an enemy unit to weaken it up, or if the recon didn't work, you might try and place the objective a second time, and then do a regular attack with the assist from the tiger, and your tiger might come out probably not uh, 
I should change this, not in its deployed side where it only has a movement of two, get it to do an engagement or drop a support, whatever's necessary. It could potentially do a shock attack or again, another engagement or an attack by fire that full of choices uh, depending on the circumstance and then assist the regular attack for the recon. That's what an attack could potentially look like. The option to take out the Stug and put it into a unit gives you some more options. You gain two more fire events and an uh, assist, but it does mean these infantry attacks are weakened. It's a choice. Do I want weaker attacks for more flexibility or not? And then let's have a look at what this might look like in defense. This is not a perfect defense by any means. It's just a defense that you might think. Let's imagine that we are defending Tata here. The Russians are coming from this side and obviously this is quite dense terrain and the roads are canalizing the attacks down into quite restricted avenues of advance. On these hexes, a Russian tank formation would only be able to attack from one hex. So it could only attack this hex from that hex or indeed this hex from that, and so on. Now, there are a lot, as you can see, of one hex attackable hexes, which actually gives you the ability to move back pretty well. So I would put defense units here, 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 and here, assuming the Russians are already kind of in this line. Now, you could take this northernmost one and push it forward, and that would be absolutely fine. I'm assuming that you are focusing on protecting Tatra here. So if that's where your HQ is going to be, you need to garrison it. If there's anything I've ever learned from a Dean Essex game ever since the 1990s, it's always garrison your HQs, duh. You'd put your HQ there and you'd put your markers uh, with it. You'll notice in this particular deployment that I am more than two hexes away from each other. This is deliberate. If your units are next to each other, or if your units are only one hex away, so if this unit was one hex back, then you could put an objective onto this unit and it would allow that unit to be attackable too. By having quite an open defense of more than two, you force the enemy to either only attack in one place with a double objective or only attack in two places with two single objectives, not getting the double objective mod, which, you know, always hurts a bit. That's not a perfect tactic. It's not appropriate all the time. It's great if you've got a large front that you've got to cover. If you're much more concentrated, you can just take the hit and move your defensive units closer together, knowing that more of them will be able to be attacked by an objective. With my defense in place here, I'm assuming that I just can't cover this avenue down there. That would be for another unit. I would then place my armor reserve here and here. Now I've put my Stugs into being an actual unit to give me more flexibility and more defense in depth. I could equally put them in support, which would mean that although this is a defensive posture, they would be available to support any counterattack. And the Tiger down here in move mode, as they should have been in the previous example, which gives them a lot more flexibility for slightly less firepower. As I say, this isn't perfect, but it's a way of thinking about exploiting the terrain, minimizing your weakness to attack, having some sort of defense in depth so that one breakthrough isn't a catastrophic breakthrough and orchestrating your units, your battalions in your formation so that the formation itself is achieving a objective for the wider battle. For thinking about defense and classically for a Deem Essex game, the game is primarily about attacking. Your best form of defense in a Dean game is attack. But nonetheless, there is some stuff you can do. So you don't have to form straight lines. You don't have to form overlapping zones of control. There are no interlocking zones of control. Garrison your HQ. Don't deploy your units too close to your HQ. Use your HQ's command radius and give your frontline units some retreating space. 
If you don't, and you don't have a legitimate retreat, your units will have to come off and come back on again the next turn, which is a bad thing. Armor and dual units are better in counterattack because it's much easier to do an engagement with armor and force it to retreat than it is to do an attack, regular attack, on infantry and force that to retreat. This also helps create some defense in depth and create some counterattack opportunities for you. Double stack your infantry sparingly. I mean, classically, I may double stack my infantry if I'm attacking and one unit is assisting and then assuming the attack goes well, one of the units will advance and the other unit won't. You can double stack defensively if the hex really, really matters, but do be prepared to take it on the chin with barrages from artillery and barrages by attack by fire because losses will be doubled. Losses will be taken on each unit. Never, it says don't, never reinforce infantry with armor. If you do, other armor can rock up, engage your armor, force it to retreat, and when it retreats, the infantry retreats with it. It actually negates infantry's holding power. Use prepared defense sparingly. The support book, which again, I encourage you to read and reread, says use it if you don't want to retreat. This is particularly helpful if you are out in the desert and there's no terrain and you want to trade steps for retreat. Use it if you are too weak to counterattack. If you have no real armor attached to your units or you have too little artillery to usefully make decent attacks, then, then fine, but it's, it's not a magic bullet. And then finally, obviously, use the terrain. Maximize your defensive bonuses, that's the easy one, but minimize your attacker options and movement. If um, we take a look back onto the map, here in Panzer's Last Stand, this terrain here is horrible. Doubly horrible if you are playing the unit traffic optional rule that can make each of these hexes into traffic unless a unit is in its deployed side, effectively gumming up these whole roads in a dreadful, dreadful way. These hills, these slopes, these forests, can really make attacks difficult with attacking units stumbling over each other in an effort to try and get into any kind of position to attack. And that's it really. If I wanted to summarize this all up in one cute little message, it would be this. Don't optimize your battalions, optimize your formations. BCS, the battalion combat series, really should have been called formation combat series or the division combat series since formations are division equivalents. That's where your focus is, whether in attack or defense. And if that means that a battalion gets to waste one of the things it could theoretically do, well, so be it, so long as it's furthering the wider objectives of the formation. I know I'm right because in the Facebook group, we had this little bit of an exchange. So Jeff asked, what would happen if you change the scale from the current one kilometer a hex, 1.2, sometimes I think 1.5, down to you know half that? And I said, well, I think if you go down to companies on a 500 meter scale, you risk losing the focus of BCS, which is formations. It really should be called Divisional Combat Series rather than BCS, as the division equivalent is the prime objective of your attention, in my opinion. It risks going down the OCS route. Nope, I'm a bit upset with the developments of OCS, particularly in the Western Front games. Of far too many ant units, as noted in the recent updates, with companies and battalions all over the place in the cross-channel attack uh, game being developed, uh, the Normandy game being developed for OCS, when really its focus should be divisions and, and break down regiments. BCS does a fantastic job of modeling division equivalents and their component battalions. Let's not risk the BCS goose. It is still laying plenty of golden eggs. And none other than Carl Fung himself said, Robert, bingo a thousand times over. Oh, how proud was I. <laughs> 
The game scale needs to remain the battalion scale with a few companies as needed. Company scale and modeling is a whole separate beast with more and weapon modeling. See the grand tactical series of games. BCS does remain at the cusp between tactical and operational in that faux grand tactical category. Lowering the scale to 500 meters a hex is only to be used in extremely tight battalion unit battles and even then only sparingly and is something that shouldn't be a default. Thank you Carl for agreeing with me. How nice. You know, proud moment. So that's where I would love you to retain your focus. When you're thinking of all of these many, many combat opportunities, particularly with the armor, that are so rich in things you could do all over the place. And that's it for this. In the next episode, I'm going to look at command, control, supply, from all the way to your supply source, to out there at the fringe, of your ability of your HQ to command units and beyond. I hope you found this interesting. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you join me for the next time. Stay safe. Bye for now.